step into the latest installment of our rebroadcast series, podcast number 63 titled, Let's Not Overlook That Fear May Grip Some, featuring Mike from COT on the End Generation Project. Originally aired on April 7, 2024, exclusively on councilofthime.com. See the link in description. Now this episode delves into Bible study and preparedness for today's solar eclipse, as well as highlighting eschatology amidst today's challenges. Join Michael from Council of Time as we explore these peculiar circumstances in this riveting episode. To understand more, visit the Council of Time's only official website, linked in description, where we encourage everyone to go and experience. We're dedicated to providing truth, hope, and support to those struggling with addiction who simultaneously are seeking God's guidance. Your support drives our mission to guide individuals toward truth, sobriety, and preparedness for what is described in scripture as perilous times. Join our exclusive locals or Kofi community for breaking news and have early access to many special features. Thank you for being a vital part of the success of the End Generation Project. Before finally delving into today's rebroadcast podcast title, let's not overlook that fear may grip some episode 63. Okay, so let's give a round of applause for the remarkable growth of this channel in such a short time, reflecting the hunger among believers for truth in these end generation times. It's truly a blessing to see our content reaching audiences worldwide with translations available in over 12 languages. As we journey together, we're committed to keeping this podcast ad-free thanks to your subscriptions. Join our vibrant communities on Locals and Kofi for prayer requests and shout-outs like you will see in this video. All right, now let's dive into today's podcast title. Let's not overlook the fear may grip some. We broadcast on the End Generation Project, podcast number 63 with Mike from Council of Time. Blessings to all. I think that uh, the last two days, people have been asking more questions. Not you guys. The general public is, uh, they have lost their minds behind this eclipse ordeal. It's amazing how quick the world is to really gather around something like that. It is estimated they're going to spend millions, right? If not billions of dollars to capture the eclipse tomorrow. And that's something. It always amazes me how people will, they'll spend money like that to go see an event. And it's, it's an eclipse They've spent hundreds of millions in equipment. I believe that um, the camera, uh, buying cameras and, and uh, things like that, billions of dollars were spent with, uh, you know, photography, lenses, and cameras, and all sorts of adaptive uh, gadgets to film the eclipse. Billions of dollars. It'd be something if the world would do that for the rest of the world, wouldn't it? That would be something. They will spend that money on a moment, right? That is something. But they will not take that same money and simply care for others around them. That's, uh, that's something else. Something to think of. But, the world gets together on events like that. They make it something. The media has made it something. And to us, to me, it is in fact a symbol. Only a symbol. Uh, a set time. And a marked time, indeed. But nothing that I would go out and lose my uh, mind over. 
But that's what the world does. They so easily, so easily buy into things like that and will give their whole paycheck to join in with festivities, right? In fact, that is the mindset of the world. They pay big money to burn it up and go party or something like that, but they won't pay anything for the sake of their neighbor. That's a very uh, not so good. You know, when it comes to people, they're very judgmental. Bad taste in their mouth, whatever you want to say, but uh, people these days, they don't like taking care of people because they have a thousand excuses as to why not. But when it comes to some celestial event, everybody would pay. You know, they, they'd rather go pay for entertainment than pay for somebody's meal. That is beyond me, right? Uh, but um, that's the way the world is. The other half of the people, and a lot of people have great trepidation behind tomorrow. Trepidation is when you're somewhat frightened, you're hesitant. Uh, have a little fear behind this situation, all right? I, I hope that you guys don't have fear. I know that some of you may have thoughts. I'm sure you've heard lots of things. Listen, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you guys, let's, let's do something here. I want you guys to remember something. Remember everything that was said. Remember, don't forget, right? Uh, some people have said, you know, the world's going to totally fall apart tomorrow. Remember those statements like that not so you can call the person out don't do that don't call the people out i want you guys to remember everything that was said about this eclipse so that when it passes you can have your mind on the real events on real things you need to prepare your families for this is indeed part of god's celestial calendar man has no control over the eclipse right so take note of the date, yes. Take note of what the Lord is doing, yes. But don't mingle in the cautions of the world and some of the sayings of, well, I hate to say it, but some of these sayings are just fear-based. Fear-based. And it can upset your day. It can cause you nervousness. Yet some young people have that nervousness. I uh, believe that... Uh, TikTok is where they get most of their information from. And they are, some of these young people have come up with some wild ideas. Some of you guys, you may have the same sentiment. Somebody asked me, was a plane going to fly over and poison um, half the people in line with the eclipse? And when I told them no, they got upset. That same thing happened by email. Somebody emailed COT, me at COT. They asked me the same question. I just wrote back, kind, no. Well, they got upset. As though, you know, they were counting on that to happen. Right? So here's what we're going to do. Because I had to speak to you guys just a little bit before this event uh, ever takes place. All right? S sometimes I'm quite bold about it. But when the world starts causing Christians fear, I have an issue. Right? I have an issue. And it is buying into the rhetoric. Uh, the world puts out. But I want you guys to start start noticing. Start noticing the difference between sound doctrine or the word of God and these sayings of the world. And make sure you separate the two. Make sure that you're not living your life by some of these sayings that are in the world. All right? Anything can happen tomorrow. It really could. Just as anything can happen on any day. Okay? But don't don't uh, don't lose your the, the good of this day, right? based on something, because I'll, I'll, somebody said, well, Mike, what are you doing tomorrow? Nothing at all. Am I going to look at the eclipse? No, I will not. To know other things is enough for me. I need not see it. I've seen them before. I have seen them before. See, because my mind is stuck on the flying insects. That's where my brain is stuck. I can't ignore the flying insects, Right? I told you guys before about the flying insects. I told you guys that lots of water surrounds the release of the bugs. Lots of water. And so many families need to be prepared for flooding. Big time. Call it coincidence if you like. 
but I trust what the Lord gives me. I don't necessarily trust anything calculated anymore, not even my own calculations. I don't. I do trust what the Lord gives me. I trust that. Right? The the rest of this stuff surrounding this eclipse, well, it's a, people use their imagination, but normally they do that when they have poor guidance. Right? Poor guidance. God gives us a sense of peace because he gives us the truth. And when you have that truth, well, you can't get upset with what's happening in the world because you end up living your life by the guided, truthful word of God. And that is key to our lives, not to live our lives in fear, right? Not to do that. But also to be ready for our families so that we can be of use to them when something does take place, right? Preparing for water is a big deal, right? It is a big deal. Hopefully people are doing that. Hopefully they are. Hopefully they're getting prepared for the winds. I hope they're doing that too. Hope they're doing that. And, isn't it funny if somebody, listen guys, just in case you don't know about the bunks, I believe it was, uh, what year was that, guys? I, I can't remember years too well. I can't remember time-based things too well. I really can't. And so it's up to you guys to keep count of many things I say. But I, I, I told you guys some years ago about a dream, right? A dream of the bugs flying out of the ground. In fact, it was in a junkyard. I was in this place in Russia. Do you guys remember that? And it was, I was walking through, it was a big junkyard, ruins all over the place in this place in Russia. I can identify that place as the Ukraine now. They look exactly alike. Now, this dream, I told you guys, maybe four, five, six years ago, right? You'd have to get with uh, Angela uh, Flash or Mayor or possibly um, uh, somebody has the dates on that, the correct dates. Anyway, I told everybody about that dream. But I was in Russia, and I was in the ruins of a junkyard or something like that. That place is the Ukraine. This happened before the Ukraine ever came about, right? This dream did. Um, all of a sudden, we were, I was somewhere else in some house with somebody and bugs, right? As the sun was starting to drop, bugs were coming out of the ground. They were coming from all different directions. And it was uh, flying insects, specifically flying insects. Well, after the flying insects came out, we were in a house, and I came outside that house. And when I looked outside the house, I could see the reflection of the sky on the ground. And I looked, and at first, because it was Russia, I thought it was ice. But it wasn't ice. It was water everywhere, water. It made no sound. There was no indication of it. Water took over every everything, and it was everywhere, right? So that was a dream, and it was so impactful. You know how you have one of those dreams that's so incredibly odd, but real, right? Uh, filled, full of small details, nuances that uh, just you, you focus in on. Well, that was one of those dreams. And it goes along with a few other dreams I had like that. In fact, the Lord has given, I, I believe this, I believe that the Lord gives me dreams because I'm the one talking on COT. That's what I believe. Because each and every time I've given you guys a dream that the Lord has given me, that I believe came from the Lord, something has come about from it. Something. Those elements of those dreams came about every single time. From Russia being in the Middle East, setting up camp and their naval ships, that happened. From that meeting that the U.S. president walked away from, that happened. Right? And they carry these long-term consequences. This one, the bugs coming out of the ground in that junkyard place in, in, uh, in Russia and going out and seeing that water everywhere. Right? When the bugs are released, you know, we're going to have that, have that water all over the place. And that will be that. And that's only the you know, earth-based tissues, the winds are coming, the sand is coming, the ash is coming, 
and people are going to have to live in that type of environment. Mm. A good compile of those uh, things that the Lord has given me so I can give to you guys. It's going to be a good one for me so that you guys will have documentation. That means somebody can take any of that stuff out of context. I'm going to make sure that you guys have it the way it was given to me so that you can see that. Right? Somebody says, can you tell us something about the new syndrome, demon face syndrome? That's actually not new. You know, I learned of that uh, issue with people. I believe it's spiritual. Listen, doctors of the world, they're, they're going to place everything in a category. Okay, if they will. They're going to place everything in a category. I don't believe it's a syndrome. I don't believe it's psychological. I don't believe it's environmental. I believe that we're in a moment, right? We're in a moment, and prophecy is coming to pass. The prophecy tells us some very important things. One of those things is people's... Or you remember, I used to tell you guys all the time that people are going to be sitting in the corner of their houses afraid to move. You remember that? Because of what? Not because of other people. Because of spirits, demonic entities, because of what they're going to see. You guys remember that, don't you? Because back then, everybody was very traditional with revelation, but they were not talking about the spiritual consequences. And I kept saying that the spiritual consequences are coming. They're coming. They unfold whatever way, you know, God, and he's doing all this, not me, right? It's just sometimes I have insights. And at that day, you know, for years, nobody was discussing the spiritual implications of revelation of prophecy coming in pass. They were not. They were talking about conventional things. Thus, the people were not. That they're not being prepared for that. And it will spread. I don't believe it's a syndrome. I believe it's something that people are dealing with. And for every one person that will go and tell a doctor that, or they discover that from you, have thousands that won't say a word. So let's say there were 15 people that had the syndrome. Well, you multiply that number times about, I'd give an average of 10,000 apiece, and you have the real numbers coming out. And it's, that, that's probably incredibly conservative. But that's the way that goes. And it's about to get a whole lot worse. Seeing them is one thing, right? Being hurt by them is something brand new, something different. That's coming also. Those are the consequences of spiritual interactions. People will be hurt by these things. People will be tormented by these things. Why? And who's going to be tormented? Those who said no to Yahshua Mashiach. Not as, not as a, you know, it's not a mean thing either. Let me tell you what it is. God is not saying, worship me or suffer. That's not what he's saying. That's not what he's saying. See, because if you believe in the Father. You're going to yield to Yahshua. And if you yield to Yahshua, right, because he loved you, his word is already spoken over you. And his word will be active over you to protect you. If you push the Lord away, you're actually pushing away life. And you're walking headlong into death. The Lord is not mean. He's not saying worship me or die. He's saying, listen, if you worship anything but me, you're going to learn the ways of death itself. And you will partake of death while you're alive. That's what he's saying. He's not telling everybody, don't do this or you're going straight to hell. That's not what he does. He is begging us from love's perspective to choose him. He designed us. He put us here on this earth, right, that we may endure this process, that we may grow, that we may see the truth and begin to live and operate by the truth, that we can overcome darkness, no matter where darkness is, that we may walk among the darkness and not choose it, to choose the good over the evil. In the Bible, it says we must learn to do good right? To cling to the good things and to shun the evil. Now, if we're going to learn that, we have to experience both. And God is praying for us and hoping for us that we choose him above all things. It, it goes back to the story 
of the person who wanted children, right? If, if a person had the power to create children, which they do, and, and a child is born, you don't want a child to love you because you forced them to. You don't want a child to give you a hug because you threatened that child if he does not. You want that child to actually choose you over everything else, right? Don't you want that child to choose you? Yes. If a child takes your advice over the neighbors, you're going to be honored. If the child takes the um, neighbor's advice over yours, you're going to be hurt. You're going to be grieved. The Lord wants us to choose him. He created us, but he will not force us to obey him. So what does he do? What is he doing? He sent his pure word through mankind. Mankind wrote his word. Mankind enacted his word, told his word, in the best way they knew how. But in all cases, that's a father begging his children to have the ways of the family in them. That's a father teaching his children how to do good. That's a father setting up everything so that the children, why would he send Christ from the beginning of time? Because he knew we'd mess up because it was all part of the process. All your mistakes and sins, all the darkness you chose, that's part of the process. In order to choose good, you must first choose something evil in order to know what good is. You must know the sting of evil. To know what love is, you must know what hatred is. To know what the embrace is, you must know what it is to be isolated and pushed away. You've been learning all these things in the earth. To have an appreciation for anything, you must be starved of it first. And all these things you've been enduring. Not out of some cruelty, some notion of somebody's dominance mindset. That's not what this is. That's your father's love over you, exposing you to everything. Can you imagine a good parent exposing his children to everything, running a risk of losing them every single day, but operating by a sovereign word and a truthful word that states they have freedom to make the choice. And do you know what's so funny? God honors your choice. If you say no to the living God, he didn't force you to say yes. He honors that. He does. Now, there's no good outcome to those who say no. There is that. Man has been allowed. Man on his own has been allowed to manipulate you, to trick you, right? To snare you if you can be snared. It is your father in heaven who has made you aware of the snare. He made you aware of the traps. He made you aware of the lies. Why? So that you could choose. So that you could choose. And every time you choose, you're choosing him. That's why you're given a life. That's why your life is more than a couple days. Because this is a process. And it takes a life to choose in the first place. He does what he does out of love. Remember that. The Father's not forcing. He's not giving us some cruel mandate. He's not doing that. He commanded his love towards us. You know what that means? He commanded his love towards us in the sending of a son. Dude, does anybody know what that means? I'll tell you what it means. Because he commanded his love towards us, he'll feel no other way about us. Because he commanded his love towards us. In that he sent his only begotten son. That means so long as Jesus has not come back. To fulfill. To fulfill judgment. God is doing nothing but loving you. That's what that means. Every act on the face of this earth. Is out of love. That's what that means. Or 
remember that. Please remember that, because if you don't, you'll live your life differently, sometimes cruelly. Very cruel. So hopefully, hopefully you understand that. Hopefully you get that anyway. People have pushed them away, and the penalties are coming. Because to push away the Father is to push away life. Or you push away life, and all things good, and love itself. You are already in death. That's why in the Bible it says, for a person, right, who has turned away from the Lord, that person is already within condemnation themselves. They're already, they're already in a place of darkness that's incredibly dark. And all of us know that, that outside of our Father's ways is nothing but death, darkness, doom, destruction, depression. We know what's outside of the living God. We do. But by the freedom of our own choices, we chose Christ. We did. And we're learning how to do good. We're learning not to choose the darkness. We are learning these things. And we're doing so of our own free will. That's why nobody should beat anybody up with the Bible on top of their heads. No. God uses his creation those of us who are obedient to him, we get used as vessels, an extension of his love for somebody else. That means the word comes through us to everybody else. That's all. Somebody says, what happens if you die during that time? The Lord, listen, if, if a person is following Christ, but they have not yet mastered their own habits of flesh, the Lord is not going to reject the word he put over you because you were in your learning cycle. Now hear me on this and hear me well. The Lord knows your truth. So not one of us is ever going to fool him. And what I mean by that is this. If I honestly am attempting, right, to do things pleasing to the Lord, he knows it. But if I'm trying to sidestep or hold up appearances for people's sake, and in my heart is no good intention to follow him at all, I am doomed already, no matter what I speak like or talk like. The Lord knows the truth of us. If a person is giving it what they've got, if they are in their truth concerning Christ, if they desire Christ and holiness and all those things of love, the Lord knows. And there's no way that person is going to go to hell. That's why you have different... He already said, right? He already gave us the notion of the first and the last, the least and the greatest. That means you're not among those who will be condemned. I reject the message of people that continue to say, well, if you're not as perfect as me, you're not going to get to heaven. They're not God. They're going to be the first ones to bust hell wide open if they continue to go around with that lie within them. They are not the standard of salvation. Christ is. He is the standard of salvation. He intercedes for us. He prays for us. He is our advocate. We have lots of shortcomings because we are but children. The oldest of us is but an infant. God knows that. He knows the truth of us. No one will ever trick him. Though, you, though a person get away with things in this world, they're not going to get away from the final verdict. You know what the final verdict is going to be? Christ knows if you truly love him or not. 
it's impossible. Listen to me. It's impossible to love the Lord and hate your neighbor. That's impossible. You can't do that. Uh-uh. Because if you love the Lord and hate your neighbor, you don't know the same Jesus God the Father sent. You know an imposter. And we're not talking about imposters. We're talking about the real deal. The Lord knows. He knows. And we know what we're doing. So we know. Listen, but if you have ever been like I was at certain times in my life, right? There were times in my life when I know I was not doing everything I could do. And I've been taken in that moment. There's no way I could have gone to the Father. Do you know why? Because my appetite for other things was larger than my love for him. He worked it out, though. He gave me time to work it out. But it, had I fallen during that time, I do not believe I would have gone with him. I don't. I believe I would have been condemned. Aren't you glad he knows that, too? And he did not let you die yet. But listen, we're coming to the close. See, when you start having signs, of the end times, whatever generation experiences those signs of the end times. They have the greatest warning of all. And if they continue to play, that's why those who see the signs of the end, the Lord said, hey, don't tarry. Rush into the fold. Rush into the fold. Because you're of the people. Where you're going to witness folks fall. And be totally condemned. My, my. You're in the place, you're in the time when people actually push against the living God. You're in a time when people start to just, they, they blaspheme in ways they never had before. There are people out there who will talk about the Bible as though they believe, but inside they do not believe. They don't believe. There was a murderer who was a, a pastor. He would have remained that way until he was caught. When I say murder, I mean a guy who was killing women. Physically killing women. Do you know how many stories there are people like that out there? And those, those are sealed. So you're not going to see any news uh, coverage of that. But you will learn about it. There's sickos out there. State troopers know it. The police know it. There's some sickos out there. And they act like they're believers in Christ. They even, they even do things in a capacity with the church, and some are pastors. And they have been busted. Busted, busted, busted. And the public doesn't know. How can a person be so dark as to speak that they love the Lord? in front of people and go and murder people in the darkness. That means they have no respect for the name of the Lord. That means they have no confidence when it comes to evil works. And if any of you are not careful, a seared confidence can easily fall upon you. A seared confidence it's when you refuse to walk in the ways of love. It's when you keep your negative days. It's when you continue to be a Charlie Brown and you're handed over to it. Then you sour all the way. That process is mentored in the word of God. If I were to tell the Lord, I'm never going to get any better then what I'm actually telling him is that I reject your teachings to do good. And I'll be the first to tell you I'm not going to reject the teachings of the Lord. Still, you have others that will provoke you to wrath on purpose, being used by dark forces to dismantle your salvation. 
there is a direct attack upon your salvation. Satan knows he has but a short time. Just as Jesus told Peter, don't you know that Satan desires you? All of you need to know that Satan is pursuing you. If you start giving up, he's right there waiting. If you turn around, he's right there waiting. If you're ready to give up, he's right there waiting not to embrace you, but to torment you. Please don't empower him in your life. Please don't do that. Have an understanding of what's happening. You're in the last moments. You're not in the early parts of time. You're not in the middle of time. You're in the last moments of time. The judgment will be soon. So be sincere about what you do concerning Christ, and you will be okay. My my advice to all of you is look towards Christ, not towards man. Man is making their choice. And they will not escape the full consequence of their choice. They continue to worship men. Things are coming. The bugs are coming. They'll take flight. And after they take flight, consequences will be here. Everything will slowly unfold from there. I want you guys to be aware of that. Not to operate in fear. So listen, I'm going to take a short break when I come back. When I come back, I want you guys to, we're going to talk about fear. We're going to purge it. Can we do that when I come back? Right? It's a small method. Small method I have. You're beginning of purging fear. Just to get rid of it. Right? Not to, no, we don't wipe it away. We purge it. You know what purging means? You uproot it and pluck it out. The only way to uproot something is to go and look for it. We have to go look for it. To pluck it out is to handle it. We're going to handle it. Then finally, give the big pluck. Right? We're going to do that. We're going to face it. We're going to handle it. And we'll purge it. This is something we can do. You know who will seal you when you purge something? Your Father in Heaven does. He does. I'll be back in a minute right here at COT. Real quick here. Fear. Fear. Let's take this eclipse, for example. What's the worst? Think of the worst outcome you could possibly think of. I mean the worst. What do you guys think the worst outcome could be? Something like Hamas? Can you imagine being in Israel when Hamas went in and did what they did? Can you imagine a mass shooting? Something blows up in a crowd. Think of the worst thing you can think of. Your worst fear. Think of it happening, and now what? Now what? Put yourself in that position. Put yourself in the worst position ever. And hear me on this. Most people will tell you, you yeah, don't think about the bad stuff, right? That's what the world tells you. Just think about the good stuff. And here's what you'll end up doing. 
you'll end up chasing. Chasing, right? Running away from everything, trying to chase a fantasy all your lives. If you think of a worst case scenario and give it deep thought, you become aware, not paranoid, aware because you don't act on it. And then you ask yourself, okay, that happens, then what? Then what? What do I do then? That's when you pull out your Bible. That's when you come to terms. And you realize the Lord is the Lord of your life. He's not the Lord of the dying. He's the Lord of the living. And if he's the Lord of the living, everything, everything is for the process. You don't know why things take place. You don't know why things are effective on some and not effective on others. But you can know this is a process. And the Lord does what is necessary for the salvation of your soul. There are things in us we have no power to break. There are directions we can follow. We have no power to alter. The Lord does. He'll break all the works of the enemy. When you come to terms with these things that could happen, there's something else you must realize. Anything that happens to you on this earth only happens to your flesh. God does not permit anything to touch your soul. He doesn't. You can have a lost soul if you shun the Lord and follow evil. Nothing touches your soul. And all things here on this earth are temporary. Nothing is permanent. I hope you know that too. Nothing is permanent. This life you're living is the daydream. This is your chance. Remember when you had that dream and you woke up and you said, thank God nobody, nobody knows about that dream, right? This is that time. This is this life where you can make the good decisions. Instead of being like you were in that dream and you found yourself in the middle of something that was at best grotesque, this is your chance. So think of your worst case scenario and then say, okay, Lord, now what? What after that? See, that's when you come to terms. You come to this foundation where you say, Lord, you're the Lord of me. You're my Lord. Whatever the outcome is, let me sell it now in my heart. Whether to follow you or not. And hopefully you follow him anyway. You know what I did that and the fear element was removed from my life. Satan lost just about all of his power. The only way he can get to me now is through other people. He cannot touch me directly. He can. And he lost a lot of his power through other people. Do you know why? Should anybody ever turn, it's not going to cause me to hate them. Because I can now see him. That's why I never hate people. I'm never angry at people. Because I can see him. Because the Lord has given us his word. And I know that when Satan is bound a thousand years, humanity is at peace. I know where the origin of a person's bad attitude comes from. I know where the bad deeds come from. I know that when he is bound, nothing can work through humanity, and humanity is at peace. That's what I know. So I'll never blame a person. Never. But I'm at war with those spirits who choose to use people. Which brings up something else. I do understand the nature of the war. It is a war. 
a war governed by the creator of all things, a war that we are engaged in, whether we like it or not, a war where humans are the casualties. And I will not, I will not make a casualty out of a human being because of the evil spirits that influence the person. I'm not at war with people, but with those spirits that choose to use people to do dark things. That's why around me anything can happen, and it will not shock me. I'm not moved by it. I am moved for the sake of the people, because they don't know. How do you handle a person who's being used by a dark spirit, and they don't know dark spirits exist? How can you be angry at a person when they have no idea they've just been used by Satan himself? You can't be. When you choose Christ, you'll look upon your fellow man and desire his freedom, his or her freedom. But you will be at war with the spirits that will defile that person. The Lord's teachings tell us what we're at war with. It's not people. When you blame a person, you're letting the spirit go free. That's what you're doing. When you're mad at the person, when you hate the person, you're, you're allowing a demon to go free. You're actually sanctioning and in agreement with the deeds of the demon. Do you know that? When you, because the end goal was to have you to reject a person. That's the whole goal. And if you reject that person, then guess what? You're working with the demons, not against them. Once you understand the nature of the warfare, you'll not find yourselves on the wrong side. Hmm? You'll not do it. Once you understand the warfare... Somebody wrote a thing in there and said, we will always fall short. Well, I don't agree with that. I don't agree with that because Christ does not agree with that. You know why? Because in the Bible it says he's able to keep us from falling, and he will perfect us. Thank you, Lord. You know what that means? Get that notion out of your head that you're always going to fall, that you're always going to make a mistake. Take that one and throw it in the garbage can. Huh. Don't run around with that mindset. Say, no, no, I'm on my way to be like the Lord. He's the one raising you, the Lord is. He's the one that's able to keep you from falling. That's what the Bible says. He is able to keep you from falling. If he is able to keep you from falling, we are the ones who keep finding ourselves in agreement with those who do fall. No, the Lord is raising us. When you raise an infant, you never tell that infant, well, son, you're always going to fall down the steps. Right? No. You have an understanding that he fell down the steps, and he may do that five or six times, but one day he'll not fall down those steps again. One day he'll navigate those steps like they're nothing. One day he will have perfected the skill. Right? One day. Never accept the notions of flesh. Your journey here can never be dictated by flesh. Do you know why? What the Lord is doing in your life is supernatural. Never forget that. You knowing the Lord is a supernatural knowing. You praying is a supernatural deed. Do you know that? That is a supernatural deed for you praying. You reading the Bible and trusting it is supernatural. All that supernatural. Everything you do is turning out to be supernatural. So don't take the advice of the world who says you're going to be just like, you know, flesh, always messing everything up. That's a lie. It's not what your father said. You're on your way to perfection. 
You're about to be fully translated. Mm. Make sure you do that. Never give yourself an excuse to go back to the bomb. Don't do that. Never, never give yourself that excuse. If you do that in the one area, it will permeate your whole life, and you will never get out of a hole. See, some people don't come out of a hole because they keep telling themselves, and they keep reaffirming to themselves, this is all I can be. Well, first of all, guess what? Only the Lord can dictate what you can be. I can't do that. You can't do that. The Lord can. And whatever you can be, you better believe, is above and beyond all things of flesh. The Lord knows exactly what you can be. If you follow him and learn to trust him, he will bring you to your predestined position. I can assure you, you are not predestined to be in the mud. No. You're of a royal priesthood. Never forget that. Kings and priests. How about that? Now, that, in saying that, that's, that's right there. That's well above just being a human being. Being of royalty with the Lord is a huge separation from being a mere person. Remember that. It will grow. Oh, and by the way, you know what the biggest thing is? You're the ones who live after the Messiah has given his life. My goodness, that makes the biggest difference of all. You are the ones who are alive after the Messiah has went to the cross. You're the empowered ones. You're the ones that can enter into a place of rest that the prophets could not enter into. And they envy to be where you are right now. Can you understand that? Can you understand that the prophets looked to you and they envied you? Can you understand that? You're the ones that can enter a place the prophets nor anybody else could ever enter into. You're the ones. So no, you're not like the rest who came before you. No, you're not. No, no, you're the children of the new covenant. You're the new wineskins, and you do not put old wine in new wineskins. You are, in fact, the new wineskins. I know people have their idea of the wine. I know they do. When I was a little boy, in fact, I believe I was six, when I first heard that, I thought of wine. Now, what is a six-year-old boy doing thinking about wine? Hmm. And I've been thinking about that ever since. I can't see it any other way than to see the wine, the new wine as the gospel, and the old wine. As that old covenant, which is why you're under a new covenant. You even have a new testador. That's what the Bible explains all of this. My goodness, you're under a brand new covering. A covering nobody else had. You're under that covering. You're the ones that everybody looked to. You know, the prophets saw you, and they were motivated. That means if we got in a group, and everybody picked out the worst person in the group, that worst person would cause a prophet to envy you. We rate ourselves in a very strange way. Yet we have no idea that we're 
surely walking in faith. Nobody else could do that. Do you know why? They had examples. See, where you have examples, you can't purely walk in faith. Where you have supernatural things already happening, you can't purely walk in faith. Most people today are frustrated because God won't give them proof. And they have no idea that they are the vessels of faith that were spoken of from the very beginning. You're the promised ones. You're living in a time that your predecessors could not navigate. They knew this time would be dark. They thought it impossible for anybody to live in a time like this and to still have salvation, yet you navigate this world. You're right in the middle of a risen devil, and you don't even know it, and you're still seeking Christ. My goodness. See, you don't know that. So you don't know. You can't rate yourself in truth. Most people today, if you ask them, they, don't, they, they have no idea that these kingdoms are dark, darker than dark itself. They have no idea. They navigate them. They choose the Lord. The people... Of yesterday, they could not handle the temptations that exist today. They couldn't handle that. They couldn't. Everything back then was straightforward. It was. It was cut dry, black and white, not today. It would almost be impossible for them to navigate anything of today. Plus, you're living in a time when darkness is truly abundant all over the place. Yet, in the middle of the night... Right now, you're walking in the nighttime, and you don't even know it, and you navigate following Christ. That's something most people will have drowned already. They would have drowned. You're in the time when knowledge has gone to and fro. It already has gone to and fro. You're walking my faith. You know what pleases God? Faith. You know when the Bible when it says it's impossible to please God without faith, you're the ones doing everything by faith. Yes, you got frustrated because you did not have proof. Yes, you needed that extra incentive from time to time. But you're still following him now. You're the impossible ones. In spite of the odds, you still have faith. My goodness, you have. You're the ones when it was stated, the first will be last, and the last will be first. You're the last ones that will be first. You're the least ones that will be the greatest. Don't you get it? Don't you get that? My, my. Somebody says their face has been making angry faces. Are you looking in the mirror and seeing the angry face? Is that when you see the angry face when you're looking in the mirror? I look in the mirror. And I no longer look in the mirror anymore. In all, in all truth, this is truthful, guys. Do you guys know that sometimes I'll go a month without looking in the mirror? I will. Go a month. Listen to me careful. Listen to me careful. Let nothing. Let me tell you guys how to overcome something. Here. Your face gets angry. You perceive yourself making an angry face. Let me share this with you. You've got the most powerful thing in the heavens and on the earth, in the earth, above the earth, beyond the earth. It's called the Word of God. You want to know the power of prayer, this is your chance. When something like that is happening to you, listen to me. I want you to say the Lord's Prayer. And when you say the Lord's Prayer, I don't want you to think about your face. Don't think about anything else other than that prayer. I want you to hear the words of that prayer. The Lord's Prayer. 
you know, the one that says, Our Father who art in heaven. See, that's the first declaration. My daddy is in the heavens. Hear that prayer. Hallowed be thy name. The name of your daddy encompasses all. You don't even know his name, but he's your daddy. Mm -hmm. And then you say the next line, thy kingdom come. There you go. His kingdom is coming. All the mishaps, attacks, hiccups, and everything else. You let everything know. Your father's kingdom is coming. Then you continue. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's when you let everything in your house. You let it know that the will of God is going to be done in the earth as it is in the heavens. As the angels continue to operate... As the throne is still the throne, so the will of God will be the will of God in the earth. And nothing will circumvent it. You are mind everything spiritual, everything in reality, and everything beyond. It is all within God's will, or it's not at all. You let it know that it can only exist within the will of God. See, because every spiritual thing out there understands and it knows that human beings are the only things that can actually walk outside of God's will. Nothing else can. You remind everything. And your Father's will be done on earth as it is in heaven and that you fully agree to that. You let them know. And still don't think about your face, your looks, your night terrors or anything else. And then you say, give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And you think about that. Give us this day, not tomorrow, this day, the moment when you need it. Give us this day our daily bread. In other words, Father, give me what I need in this day. You're not greedy. That daily bread is everything you need for this day. That's in compliance with the teachings of Christ. The sayings of the prophets as given by the creator. Hmm? He'll supply your needs. He'll supply your needs. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. That's a reminder for yourselves. Lord, forgive me as I have forgiven everybody else. Do you hear me? Listen to me. As you forgive everybody else, so will your Father in heaven forgive you. That's why you don't want to go another day without having forgiven everybody. If you seek forgiveness from the Creator, you better forgive everybody in your life. Because in the Bible it says, if you have not forgiven somebody in your life, anybody in your life, all those in your life, then your Heavenly Father has not forgiven you. And if he's not forgiven you, you're cursed. Hope you know that. See, some people, the Lord loves you, but you're still under a curse. Do you know why? Because you will not forgive those in your life. You're not to have anybody in your life you have not forgiven. If you fail to forgive anybody, your Father in Heaven will not forgive you. You know what that means? Some people have not forgiven people all their lives. And they don't even understand that they have never been forgiven of anything. They don't understand that. And it's eating their lives away. See, they don't get that. Some people thought it was a joke. If you do not forgive, your Father in Heaven will not forgive you. And that means some people have never been forgiven, and their life is cursed. The Lord loves you, but your life is cursed. He has mercy and grace upon you, but your life is cursed. Haven't you ever wondered 
why you get so far and everything collapses. That's part of the curse. You want that curse removed? You better release everybody. That's the truth of your father. That's the mandate. If you seek forgiveness, then release everybody on the face of this earth. Those who are here and those who are gone, release them all. Then your father will forgive you. But if you do not, you've not been forgiven of anything. And if you die in that state, there is no life for you. There's no life for you. Somebody said, I can forgive, but carry the hurts and the feeling of rejection. Oh, my goodness. That's a three-hour conversation I would have on my feet talking to anybody about that. There's not one person in my life I've not forgiven. But see, in order for you to understand that, you need to know what has transpired in my life. That's why you go through bad moments. Because I'm going to share that with It's going to be a long talk. I'm going to share that with you all that have issues forgiving people. The ones who operate by that term, what is it? I forgive, but I won't forget. Let me tell you something. You better throw that in the garbage. I have forgiven and I forgot. I forgive and forget. There's no way I'm going to forgive somebody and never forget. Somebody asked me the other day, well, don't you hurt in the heart? I said, yep. And I don't want to change that for anything. Oh, yeah, I can talk to you about it. See, you go through things in this world, not so you can brag about what you went through, but so that somebody else can see what you've been through and thank God for his deliverance because they've been through something similar. So you can offer them hope through truth, not through a lie, but through truth. It's somebody else's story that inspired you in the first place. Somebody else's story that gave you strength. Somebody else's story did something to you. And it was good. When you know the depth of one's pain, and you see the process that they trusted in Christ, and you see the proof of that process. That's like having a key to the lock on your life. The Lord knows we need an example. He knows that. Some people, one person, I remember one person, they said, well, I'm in pain daily. And they thought I was not in pain daily. When they found out I was in pain daily, it helped them out a little bit. The Father did not promise us to get through life, right, without being uh, having a couple lumps in a couple places. He did not promise us every day is going to be smooth sailing. He did promise us the victory. I'm telling you right now, the victory is yours. If you, if you will follow the one and can agree with the one who promised the victory and not simply just chase it. See, some people follow Christ so they can have the victory. Do you not know that I follow Christ to honor him? And I'm not concerned about the victory. Most people, they conform to the Lord. So they won't lose things in their lives. What about a person who's already lost everything? Oops. Nothing can be taken from that person. That person can never be blackmailed. (laughs) 
I'll say it again. I've said this many times before. Something has crept into the church and attempted to weaken it. And it's time to uncover that. That strength may be found in the resolve of your faith. That the Lord's way be established in your life. That nobody follow Christ as though it's a deal. But purely out of honor and truth. Full of praise and thanks. It's almost impossible to have true thanks if you don't understand your own process. Hmm? Somebody says the Bible teacher told us today that Philippians 2 2 means to have an open mind. Oh my goodness. Well, we're going to leave that one. Right? Because uh, an open mind. How about this? How about we all have the mind of Christ as much as we're able to? I don't know about you guys, right? But Christ has a peace that surpasses all understanding. And when we have that mind, we have a peace that surpasses all understanding. To have the mind of Christ is to have the mind of an overcomer. Is to have a mind in perfect peace. Is to be resolute and full of faith is to be thorough through and through. It's to not live one's life in error. Right? But can have the liberty to appreciate the Most High and everything that the Most High has within His will. So that when you say God's will be done, hands go up in the air because they know that God has a good will. Not like the other folks that when somebody say God's will be done, they get upset, cross their arms, and have an attitude. Do they not know that God's will is the best way a thing can be done? Don't they know that? See, that's why people walk around with fear. Too heavily laden with the teachings of flesh, which are teachings of the world which are teachings born in death, not life. What our Father teaches us are teachings of life and not death. God is a God of the living and not the dead. Charlie Brown really has to be buried, don't you guys think? time for him to go no more Charlie Browning the Lord's way is the most honorable liberating victorious way we can ever know Handling your fear is to accept an outcome. Accept it this way, though. To have your own declaration. To be able to say, Lord, no matter what the outcome is, it's your outcome and nobody else's. To begin to understand that nothing is by chance. That when it comes to your life, it's by design. Do you hear me? When it comes to the life of someone who believes in Christ, everything that happens in your life is by design. You know that's in your Bibles, right? When it comes to your life, the ones who believe in Christ, everything that happens is by design. Chance does not play a role. Coincidence does not play a part. Everything is by design. So if something happens, it only happens because it must happen. And if it must happen, God is doing it for your deliverance, not for your bondage. He's doing it to break what cannot be broken, to free what cannot be freed. He's doing the impossible and the supernatural in your life. 
You have no idea of the level he will bring you. You can only read, have faith in the level he told you about. But he has already communicated to us. We don't have a capacity to understand the fullness of where he's going to actually bring us. We do not have the mind to comprehend the complete process of how he will fully deliver us. That's why trust is so incredibly important. So don't think it's strange when you go through fiery trials. Hmm? Do you hear me? Don't think it's strange when you go through fiery trials. In other words, that's something you do. See, because faith is never forced. Faith is something you agree to live by or not. That means that's within your power to initiate it or not. As for me, I choose to walk by faith, never by sight. I'm not moved by what I can see. I'm moved by the revelation from the living God, which is found in his word. The other words. Everything in your life is working something out. You better believe it. Everything in the believer's life is by design. It is never by chance. That's why you don't think it's strange when you go through fiery trials. Diverse temptations. That's why. Because it was explained to us why those trials come. Why the temptations come. Why we go through what we go through. The Lord told us over and over again, this is not happening by chance. It's happening because it needs to happen. Because it wakes hearts of us up. But we do live in the days where the Lord has already warned us. He said the days would come when men would no longer endure sound doctrine, but would heap to themselves teachers having itchy ears. You know what? I'll tell you something. The Lord is my teacher. And I hope he's yours too, and nobody else is. That's what I'm hoping. You know when the Bible it says, how can one hear less one be sent? Right? Everybody has access to the word of God. It's everywhere. The word has been sent everywhere. You know what the issue is? The issue is people do not want to read sometimes. I had a friend. I had a friend who... Who... Uh, he said, it's hard to read the Bible. And all I would tell him was okay. And somebody asked me, they said, well, why won't you give that guy advice and tell him to just, you know, push through? I said, because when he's ready, he's not going to allow any obstacle to stop him from knowing who Christ is. That's when he'll be ready. When it comes to the Lord, you're ready when you're ready. See, when you really want to know who the Lord is, and, and there's something about us, when we want something, right, we're not going to allow anything to stop us from getting it. Everybody right here today is alive, aren't they? You're, you're not dead, you're alive. You know what that means? You wanted some food because you were hungry. You're still alive because you allowed nothing to get in the way of your eating some food. Well, to me, the word of God is like that. I can forego the food. I have to have the word. I don't let anything get in the way. When you really want something, you will go and get it. You will not suffer anything to hold you back from what you really want. Hmm? When you really want it. And guess what? A person is ready when they really want it. 
That's why it's no good to force the word upon anybody. When they're ready, they'll go and get it. If they never go and get it, then they were never his. Isn't that something? That's why nobody should be tricked. Listen, you live in the days when people are being shown for what they truly are. You're going to find that some people never belong to Christ. See, you, do you guys think Christ is going to lie when he says, depart from me, you worker of iniquity? I never knew you. He's not lying. He never knew them. We just didn't know who they were, and it's designed to be that way. Do not be surprised when people fall away from the faith to your left and to your right. Listen, I give you this caution. They will attempt to take you with them. They will lighten the way of faith. They will tell you that sin is okay. If anybody tells you that sin is okay, that everybody sins and you're going to sin and they start going down that road, you start resisting. Even in my sin... I did not allow anybody to tell me, well, you're going to sin. I didn't want anybody to tell me that. Even when I was sinning, I didn't believe that garbage. That was garbage. That's a person who thinks lightly of the Messiah. And if you think lightly of the Messiah, how can you know him? Anybody who truly knows the Messiah will never think of him lightly, never. Because he gave everything at the cross. So how can you know of someone who gave everything at the cross and then speak of that someone lightly? You can't do that. Anybody who exhorts sin. Over the cross is a foolish person. They don't even know the Messiah. Because to know the Messiah is to be acquainted with the cross. And when you're acquainted with the cross, you will suffer nothing to stop you from honoring the Messiah with everything that you are. And when you find out that the Father ordered this, demanded that because of his love for us, and that Jesus was in full agreement. Oh no, that's a double whammy. You'll never allow satanic words like that to wheeze into your life. Let not, only a demon would tell you that sin is okay. Only a demon would tell you, oh well, it's a small sin, don't worry about it. Nope. You're not to go around beating yourselves, that's dumb. The Lord died for all, once and for all. No, but to honor the Lord is to seek him by faith, not by proof, by faith. It's to live by his word because you honor him. See, I don't know about you, but the love demonstrated at the cross is a love I understand. You know why? Because I'm full of sacrifice. When you're full of sacrifice, when you've given much up for other folks, right? Do you know what sacrifice is? And you can identify with the cross. If you're stingy and greedy and all you do is think of yourself, you're not going to have a good image of the cross. You're not going to identify with it. But when you sacrifice... See, Jesus gave his life for the same people that spit in his face. So in this life, when people take advantage of you, when they backstab you, when they do all manner of evil against you, and you do nothing but bless them, then you know about sacrifice. Then you know the cross. You don't know the cross until somebody backstabs you. And all you will ever do to them is love them. Until you can do that, you don't know the cross.
Because that's precisely what the Messiah did for us. Do you know how many times in my life I agreed to sin that spitting in the Messiah's face? That stomping on the place where he was buried. That is dishonoring the Most High. Do you know that? Every single time I agreed to sin, I spit in the face of the Messiah. I voided his death, rejected the cross. That's what my agreement with sin was. That's what agreement with sin is. I know people don't talk about sin that way. But isn't that the way it is? And yet he never turned away. He never took back that measure of faith. He never did that. Because I still believed. And with great patience, suffering all my foolishness, he still called. That's the Messiah. That's our Lord. That's the love of our Father. To truly suffer our wickedness, our purposed wickedness, and love us anyway. Somebody asked me, well, how do you know the Lord loves you because you still believe in him? If the Lord did not love you, it would be impossible for you to believe in him because that measure of faith would not be within you. You'd be given over to a reprobate mind. You'd be scratched from the book of life. You'd be done for. So long as you believe in the Messiah, you're his. My advice is never take that for granted. See, a lot of people find it hard to stop sinning. I did not. I developed a deep desire against sin. Much of the things I used to do became nothing overnight because of the cross. When you seek to honor the Lord, you're not going to allow the sin you know of to come back. You simply won't allow it. You won't wrestle with it. You'd die first before that sin ever came back. You would not permit anything to cause you to defile the act of Jesus of Nazareth. The one and only person, the one and only person who fully gave his life for you. And you did not love him, that Messiah, that Messiah, listen to me, that's why the Lord said, stop having all these other doctrines, didn't he, he said that, he did. When you have other doctrines, they fight against the purity of your heart. It's servitude towards Messiah. See, you desire something, but you can't achieve it. The reason why is because you have other doctrines floating around in your mind. Do you not know that everything you look into becomes a part of your environment? So you have the words of other doctrines wrestling with words of faith. And you're stuck. Time to make a choice. It's time to make a choice. You know that scripture where it says, if you don't hate mother, brother, sister, father, and all these other things, you cannot be his disciple. Lots of people have asked me about that. I fully understand that. Do you know why? Nobody can be a disciple of Christ if anything can get in the way of it. If anything can cause you to compromise the word of God, if anything can make you stumble at any stage of your walk, you can't be his disciple. Do you know why? Satan loves for people to get built up when they get built up to a certain degree. If they'll fall prey to something, he'll do it. He'll cause them to go in deep error at some point in their life after 
after people are looking to them because he wants to maximize the damage. And then when that person falls like that, right, don't give up so easily out of embarrassment and everything else. Imagine a person who has an who builds up in the word of God, they're going places, doing wonderful work, but their child calls and says, I'm sick, you have to come home right away. Now the average person would never understand. What is the dad supposed to do in that case? Everybody cannot be his disciple. See, the Lord said, consider the cost. You've got to consider the cost. You have to lose everything and be willing to lose everything for the sake of the word of God. You have to do things decent and in order. And to be willing to forego everything for the sake of Christ. Listen to me carefully. Satan is not going to work through a stranger to get to you. He's going to work through the closest thing to you to get to you. That means he'll try to work through your children. He's going to try and work through your spouse. He's going to try and work through anybody close to you. In that case, what would a person do if they're weak? If they're not ready to go headlong, for the sake of Christ, in love with all respect, having an understanding of his family, right? But putting the kingdom first. You cannot put the kingdom first by denying your own hand. You can't do that. You can't put the kingdom first cutting people off. It doesn't work that way. You can't cut people off that way. No. You're going to have to give it your all, and it will require all of you. That means when everybody else goes to sleep at night, you're not going to sleep. You're pulling double shifts, and you're not complaining. That's what it means. If anything, in other words, if anything can stop you from listening to your father, you can't be a disciple of Christ. Because when the Lord sends a person, they have to go when he sends them. They can't say, wait, Lord, I'll go after I do this and the other, then I'll go. It's too late. God's timing is finite, perfect, right? But when you put things in order, see, here's the key. When you put things in order, oh, you know, you know the routine. That's when you call everybody up and say, listen, I got to go do this thing now. I have to do it right now. You already know they're going to have a problem from beginning to end. We'll handle everything when I get back in the Lord's timing. Then you go and you handle everything. Of course, you're going to have people that won't understand the depth of your duties unto the Lord. That's just the one part of the price you're going to pay. But never mistake that for a person who would use the Lord as an excuse to get away from his family. Never, never fall victim to the individual who would use the word of God to get out of responsibilities. For his family. As I said before, when a person does that, they're doing double, triple, quadruple shifts. They're not using God as an excuse to get away from the kids, to get away from the spouse, to get away from the home, to duck responsibilities and this, that, and the other. That's not what they're doing. They're taking care of all of it. They've taken on all that responsibility and they're not complaining not one time. Remember that. The Lord should never be an excuse. Consider the cost and truth. But the Lord has set so many people up. That's why, that's why the Lord said, don't, don't call yourself. Don't be so quick to call yourself a teacher, a preacher, or anything like that. Don't be so quick to do that. Let the Lord place you. Let him, let him put you where you're predestined to be. Everybody he called is predestined. Do you know that? If God called you, you're predestined to end up somewhere. Remember that. 
You're predestined for that. So when bad things happen, right? Don't shy away from that. Look right into it. Start looking right into your fears. Then after it takes place in your mind, you say, okay, well, Lord, I still belong to you. You're still Lord of my life. I agree with your will, your method of raising me. Listen, because those, how many of you complained about anything in the last month? If you have, if you have, then what you're essentially doing is this by your complaints. You ready? You ready? When you complain about something, you're actually, you're actually, and I'm talking about those complaints where you say, well, I, I wish the Lord wouldn't do that. I don't like how he's doing that. I don't want to go through this again. You're doing everything to dodge certain things. You know, the Lord, what you're actually doing is you're saying, Lord, I do not like the way you're raising me. Father, I do not like the way you're raising me. When you murmur and complain, you tempt the Lord your God. You know that, don't you? See, you have agents out there in the world who are full of the devil or full of being utilized by spirits because they don't know themselves. And they will teach you messed up doctrines like this. Well, you know, everybody complains. God understands. No, don't do that. You will tempt the Lord your God by murmuring and complaining. When you do that, you're in disagreement with the Father's process in your life. That means you've thought in yourself to be higher than him. You did just as Satan did. Satan did the same thing. Satan said, essentially, well, I'm deserving of a position much higher than you created me for. Satan did not like what God had appointed Satan to. So Satan sought to have a higher position than what God appointed him to. And that was his mistake. And he acted on it. And that was his fall. There are many people out there right now, you may be in your process, right now in your process today, you may not like what's happening all around you. You need to take a step back. Take a step back and say, Lord, wait a minute, let me stop before I say another word. I embrace your process for my life. And then say, Lord, please help me to understand the process you have for my life. And then wait for the answer. He will show you what he's doing. He will show you what he's doing. You know, one of the greatest gifts you can have in life is not to get out of a problem, but to have an understanding as to why the problem was in the first place. When the Lord gives you understanding, I'm telling you right now, you can have the problem and have an enjoyment you never thought you could ever have at the exact same time. There have been times I have embraced the trial. I said, oh, yes, it's back. There was a time I had a trial that I was missing. See, because I know something. I know that in a trial, it is so genuine that only certain thoughts and certain mindsets and certain things can happen in a trial. They cannot happen outside of a trial. And sure enough, when that trial hit, I could see it. I could identify it. I got excited. It was two or three days later, my mindset changed and I saw what I can never see outside of that trial. Do you not know that when you're in the middle of a trial, you can see things you cannot see outside of that trial? Hmm? Listen to me. When a trial comes, you have a vision, an ability to see things you cannot ever see unless you have that trial. In my case, there are things about me I'm unable to see unless the trial comes. When the trial comes, I start seeing the truth. I see through all the lies, all the facades, all through everything. And I say, there it is, Lord. And I get excited because when I can see something within me that I can pluck out, I pluck it out. It's almost like a person, Everything is going right in their life, and they trust in the Lord. They say, oh, yes, I trust in the Lord. And nothing goes wrong in their life, and they do this for 25 years. Well, guess what? On the 26th year, let's say their spouse dies, two of their children die, they lose their family fortune, and everything starts going downhill, I can assure you. That person not having gone through that before is going to be close to a nervous breakdown because they never knew that they were prone 
to mishaps of tangible things. They thought they would be strong no matter what. They did not know the strength of, of, of tangible things. They didn't know that they were addicted to the comfort by wood and by brick, which is called a home. They didn't know that the reason they were so excited about the Lord is because they were getting everything they wanted. Well, when the time came, when everything they wanted was zapped away and they didn't have anything, the same person found out they didn't have any praise in them. See, a trial can reveal things you would never know. When a person gets upset when problems come, and they cannot say, Lord, your will be done, when they can't say that when their problem comes, it's because they had too much comfort and a false sense of excitement, having everything they wanted. Well, let me share this with you. The time must come when things are stripped away from people. And then we're going to know who would say praise the Lord or not. Because it is easy to say thank you, Lord, or praise the Lord when you have reasonable you know, things that you need. What happens when you're hungry for a couple weeks? What happens when you have to move because you can't afford your rent at the other place? Hmm? What happens when you adjust your entire life? Because that massive career you had, you just walked away from out of some moral obligation of something nobody else can see. What happens when you go from seven figures to two figures? Who's going to say, thank you, Lord, then? Who's going to say the Lord is good then? Huh? We're going to find out. See, some of us have already been through that. Some of us have already been stripped. And nobody knew it save the person that went through it. Because the person that went through it, if they were real, they would still say, thank you, Lord. They wouldn't complain to anybody. Nobody would be the wiser. Why? Because the Lord was real in their lives. That's why. It's time for us to see the truth, isn't it? Many people, they say so many things. You remember that one day when I told you guys about that term, people saying, well, I can't stand a liar. Remember that? Listen, and the reason why I keep people away from that term is this. I, you know, until, until the Lord begins or completes this process with us, you don't know what potentials are within you. And you don't want to condemn yourself before it is ever shown. Speaking of the real deal. So instead of saying, I hate a liar, say I'm against the spirit that would ever tell another human being a lie is okay. When you go through things in this world, you have wisdom. You get older. You're, you're wiser. For example, a liar. Many lie because they're frightened. Many lie because they're unaware they're lying. Like when somebody calls them. But it's an inconvenience at that moment. They say, hey, I'm going to call you back. I'm in the middle of something very important. And they get back watching their show or doing whatever they're doing. That was a big lie. Right? That was a big lie. See, people lie all the time. When you understand that people can lie because they're fearful, what about that woman who has nowhere to turn? She didn't know what choice she's going to make, and she's physically abused. And she's telling everybody she's okay. She's not okay. She's not okay. What about the people that tell everybody they're all right and they're not all right? What about the folks that out of a sense of weird pride, they say, I don't need anything and they really need things. Those are lies too. What about the kid that lies because he's trying to survive? Hmm? How many times would a person lie to cover for somebody else? 
I had a friend one time, he said, after coming to the Lord, he said, I hate a liar, and I jumped on him for that. And I reminded him that with his abusive father, he lied to everybody every single day. And I told him, I said, have an understanding of the spirit behind the lie first. Don't sit up there and hate a liar. Introduce that liar to the Lord. That salvation come in their life. Can you imagine a person that's lying about the scars on their body because they're covering for an abusive parent? Because they know if the parent is taken, they go into the foster system. So instead of hating that person that's lying, how about understanding them? What about the Christians that lie because they're terrified to be picked out of a crowd? Hmm? What about that person? Hmm? God will humble every single vessel that would be so pious as to believe somehow they've made it. It's time for us to be real. And stop thinking up excuses to hate someone. And get into the war. And stop the casualty count. Be part of that solution. Instead of practicing hatred. Don't hate the person for what the spirit does. Love the person. And seek to have that person freed from that spirit. better outcome. That's why you have to be careful of your own speech. Certain certain phrases that seem popular, it doesn't make them right. It actually weakens the body of Christ a great deal. And without knowing, sometimes we repeat some of the strangest things. Face everything, folks. And realize something. Your father in heaven. Oh he wants the best for you. And this life you're living is a process. That's meant to deliver you. It's meant to have you overcome all darkness. That in the end. No matter what. You'll never choose darkness. Well folks listen. I'm not going to hold you. I'm going to let you guys go. I'm going to say God bless everybody. Don't be shocked if I just pop on randomly tomorrow. I know people are going to have broadcasts tomorrow. I may, uh, I may digress because so many other people are going to have bro broadcasts. But I may have it been that hour, okay? Uh, and uh, let's hope everything goes on schedule at 7 p.m. tomorrow. Uh, I can't be sure about that because of certain uh, policies. Hopefully. I will, but if not, you guys will hear from me at some point tomorrow. God bless and keep all of you. Time to get our schedule done for the site. I'll see you next time right here at COT. God bless.